last week, myself along with the first vice president, you know we have a collaboration that's going on with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They had a Black History Month program over at their headquarters in D.C. And they came out last year and gave us a presentation on uh, shooters, active shooter drills, and they also gave us a presentation on hate crimes. So their extended invitation to this branch and other branches to go over and celebrate uh, Black History Month where Joe Madison was the guest speaker. How many of you know Joe Madison? He don't bite his tongue. And he didn't bite at the FBI either. But it was a good time. A good time. The Virginia State Conference of the NAACP where I serve as an executive uh, member of the executive committee. And as many of you know, the regional vice president. So that's about 13 branches north of Spotsylvania. Uh, I've been staying busy. Uh, went out to Fort Core. Uh, a few weeks ago and met with them. Uh, you're laughing. I get that name all screwed up. Uh, but they're doing, they're doing really well, and my goal is to get out and see and visit every branch in Region 3, which is Spotsylvania, Fredericksburg, Winchester, Fairfax, you name it, uh, and help them out a little bit, not only with their fundraising but also with their membership. So with that, as I talk about the Virginia State Conference at NAACP, I want to give my uh, friend from the Virginia State Conference a minute, if you just want to say anything about membership. Um, what you have on your, in your seats tonight are membership applications. Our membership applications. Now, also on this, this seat you have a copy of, as a breakdown, talks about, okay, for $30 a year, where does your membership go? This is put together by NAACP National. A small fraction of what you give comes back to the branch, but in the big scheme of things, it helps a lot of people. And our branches function basically off, you know, from fundraising and membership. That's where we get our, you know, the money to do Freedom Fund banquets and scholarship programs. And many of you know last year, had it not been for some pretty good you know, donors, we wouldn't have been able to give out 20, over $25,000 in scholarships. $25,000. But yeah, there's, there's <laughs> that's a lot of money for a branch. And I'm so proud of what uh, everyone here has been doing over the years and we will continue to do. So what we're asking, if you have a membership with NAACP, you get the emails from National, hopefully, maybe you don't, um, and you're out of bounds, or you, it's past time, sign back up tonight. We need you, sign back up tonight. Um, and if you haven't registered or, or have, are not a member of the NAACP, it's $30. You can register by filling out the form, leaving it with us tonight, or you can register and go online. Come be part of us. Come be part of the family. We really appreciate it. My goal, we have a membership chair, but when I go out and about, we can't do anything without membership. And we need a little bit of revenue as well to, to, to do that. None of us are getting paid for what we do. It's all volunteerism. So think about it. Uh, join us in this fight because I told, like I told the executive committee meet, uh, tonight, you know, the faithful few can't continue to fight this battle. It takes more than five people to run an NAACP. It takes more than just a president. It takes a community and people that are passionate about civil rights. See, civil rights almost like equality and equity. It can't just be a buzzword. You got to know a little bit of history about civil rights, too, if you want to be a part of it. And, and I'll tell you right now, some of our civil rights and our civil liberties are being challenged today. And that's why we have people like Derek Johnson, who's a great leader and CEO of our NAACP, who's out there on the front line. And we're here on the front line in the, in the, in the cities, in the counties, doing our best to be those representatives on the school board and the county board, wherever it may be, state legislator, talking on behalf of our people. And that's all people regardless of race, color, creed, religion. Okay. Right now we're gonna have, briefly, uh, some verbal reports from our political action committee, followed by, did you wanna say something? Cause you gave me the little, come on up. Let's give our uh, chair of the Virginia State Conference membership committee a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna be very brief. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as your president said, membership matters. It truly, truly does matter. There's so much work for us to do. 
As you all know, we have the 2020 census coming up this year. We have the national election. We have got to make changes. Um, I, again, do everything you can to make that change. But first and foremost, be a member of this illustrious organization. If you look at the history, we've done a lot of things and still ahead of us, there's a lot to do. I'm gonna leave you with this. There are three kinds of people in the world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. Be one of those who make things happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, Detta, our Chair of Political Action Committee, come on up. Okay, real, really quickly. Um, so, the NAACP did wonderful work on Lobby Day, and I think that we talked about it last, last time. Just wanted to let you know that we're making progress on the marijuana rules. Um, we were going for uh, legalization. We're at decriminalization at this point, but everything's moving forward. The grand larceny threshold is going up to at least a thousand. Uh, we were asking for two thousand. Got a thousand. We got we got an increase a couple years ago. Now we've got it up to a thousand. We're going to keep going. Gonna keep going. Um, and there's some housing uh, discrimination rules that are, are that are changing, which is great. And they're you know they're um, making it so that you can't ask for the source of income. So you know there's a lot going on. A lot of voting rights stuff that's going on. So. This NAACP is down there lobbying, and we hope that everybody comes out next year and helps us on Lobby Day. Um, we j just a couple more things. Um, there's the Feel the Heritage uh, Festival coming up in Green Valley. Uh, we're going to have a table there. If anyone wants to come and participate and sit at the table and, and you know talk to people about the NAACP, NAACP, please come and see me afterwards. Uh, we're going to do, um, we're starting to do uh, our emphasis on voter registration. We go to a lot of the affordable housing in Arlington and we go all over the place, wherever we can staff voter registration. So please, you know, come and join me and the rest of the group to, um, to um, do voter registration. Finally, we're doing postcard parties. Um, these are kind of um, fun things to do because um, you know, we have a, a very nice postcard. It says, um, uh, vote, our lives depend on it. It has a, a nice picture on it. We're writing into African-American communities that have historically had low turnout. And we think that this is an, a very effective thing to do. Churches are signing up. So if your church wants to do an event, we can like prepackage an event, uh, an activism event for your church and, and write into, um, into different neighborhoods. And that's it. I know this is a special night, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dada. We're going to ask, uh, does it matter, our, both of our co-chairs or one of our co-chairs of the Education Committee to come up and give us a verbal brief? Thank you, Simone. I saw the email. Hi everyone, please forgive me, I'm a little upset right now. I just finished watching the Virginia Department of Education and the University of Virginia kill our literacy bill in the uh, Senate Public Education Subcommittee. So, um, we have a civil rights crisis and that crisis is illiteracy. Our students are not doing well statewide. Our black students are doing even far worse. Even in Arlington, right here, our black, Hispanic, students with disabilities and English learners are performing below the Virginia state average when we spend 20,000 per pupil here. So, um, just one second. So, the fight continues. This is the first year that we've taken on writing legislation because we didn't know what Arlington is going to do, what APS is going to do for our students. So, we figured we'll fi fire on all cylinders. We'll lobby our school board to have a re early reading screener and structured literacy instruction and at the same time work it on the state level 
So we've lost the state level battle, but we've been lobbying the school board and um, our super, as interim superintendent has agreed to at least um, uh, expand a pilot of a rapid automatized naming screener that will detect at kindergarten students at risk for reading disabilities. So that's been our major initiative. Yes, I have two hands. Uh, yes, I, just, I just wanted to point out that the standards of learning for Virginia is among the lowest in the country. Lowest in, in the country, absolutely. Of rigor. Yes. So when we're talking about uh, our children not doing well, that means that they are not doing well, not only in Virginia, but throughout the nation. That's right. Our SOL is the floor compared to the rest of the country. Hi, Alex. Um, which bill number? HB 332. So it got passed to next year, but this is the fourth year we've advocates have tried to have a reading screener um, introduced in Virginia, right now, in our state, only 33% of our fourth grade and eighth grade students, according to the nation's report, are reading at proficient levels. That is horrific. California just sued their Department of Education, um, and their numbers look better than ours. Yeah. I, I, I actually had I, I, I was, I was before. The good news is Jennifer Carol Foy's bill on um, dress code equity to prevent discrimination against hairstyle, braiding, and dress, and uh, your ethnic identification passed the subcommittee right before ours did. So that's good news. So there are some good things happening. The fight continues. What I've learned is next year we need an army of supporters to storm these subcommittee meetings because that's what VDOE and Department of Education and the School Board Association did. They brought their own army to defeat it. So, thank you. I'm a little bitter, so let me turn this mic over. <laughs> but it's a big deal that they needed an army yes. to defeat. And that's a big deal. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you
Unstable beings mowing down innocents, little boys and little girls. I can hear the wails of a heartbroken mother stuck at the border, begging for her children to be in her arms again. They tell us to go back to our countries from Africans to Spaniards, Muslims and Jews, all in that order. Too afraid to leave the safety of our homes, they might start sending bullets through the door. They say the men in blue protect and serve, but I'm from the hood, I've never seen that happen before. Riots and protests never work. We're still being shot down, never healing what's hurt. Can't wear my hoodie up anymore because I might be accused of something I never did before. If ignorance was a song, it'd be a number one hit. I'm so afraid for the future generation, afraid they'll have to deal with this. Men degrading and hating on women that that turned them down. You call me out of my name, but you're truly a clown. Men in agonizing pain saying that, saying that they're fine because they were taught boys aren't supposed to cry. You tell us kids to stop being lazy and open our eyes, but our future is set, we're all dying inside. So, so don't try to stop me when I try to cut all ties. Dear 2045, I don't think we're gonna survive. Mankind has failed, you could see it in our eyes. From the society's mistakes to the world drowning in flames. Dear 2045, our world will never be the same. Ladies and let's give a round of applause. Amazing. I wonder if I what could she have done if I had given her more time? Wow. We thank you so much, Miss Reed. We do appreciate you. Please come back. And the words you spoke are just astounding and true. Now, it wouldn't be a black history moment if we didn't have some black music, some spiritual base where we all started from, where every song, everything that we go to now, every hip hop, jazz, rock and roll started with the spiritual hymns of the fields and things of that nature. So not only do I have a person that will blow you out of this room, but she is my friend. So I want to bring up Miss Karen Archer now. Thank you to my friend for that wonderful introduction. She is truly a friend, a wonderful person. And in keeping with Black History Month, I just wanted to do a, a simple song, but it's that song that you might hear the old mothers and uh, singing and giving messages to one another, or just even just to, to sing about what's going on with them and pleading to the Lord for some help. So this little song is just that, um, call and response kind of song that you would hear in the churches or in the field. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey. Help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. While I'm waiting, I want you to help me. While I'm waiting, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey. Help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. While I'm down here singing, I want you to help me. Oh, while I'm down here singing, I want you to help me. Oh, help me on my journey. Help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, 
I want you to help me. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. Help me on my journey. Help me on my way. Oh, Lord, I want you to help me. I do appreciate your attention. I appreciate the spoken word and absolutely we appreciate the song. It is our brief Black History moment, so I turn it back over to the president. Let's give the participants a round of applause again. Uh, we had one more uh, distinguished member of our branch, a civil life member of our branch, walk in, and I want to publicly recognize her at this time, our Commonwealth attorney, Ms. Parissa Deganatafi. Thank you for your attendance. Were you laughing, Mr. President? So, Mr. President, and uh, come on up. You got to do the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, we're just going to go It is our distinct uh, honor and privilege, as you guys know today, Congressman Don Byers is here today. If you turn on the back of your agenda, it has his complete bio. I'm not going to read it for you, but. Um, he, we always appreciate the congressman because he's supported our branch over the years. He supported our functions as well, and he's still out there fighting for us. So it is indeed truly an honor and a privilege to have him in, t in attendance today. Do you have anything to say? No, I'm just very proud to have worked for his election, and I intend to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, Congressman Don Byer. Thank you. Thank you. I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> well, thank you very much for welcoming me here tonight. I was, I was thrilled to be invited, and um, I feel, I can't remember when I feel like the thing, because I became a life member of the NAACP years ago, but it was in Richmond, so I don't know whether, who's keeping records of any of this stuff. I should probably send some more money, I think. <laughs> it would be a good idea. Uh, but I would like to uh, introduce my wonderful chief of staff, Tanya Bradshaw. Uh, Save me a wave. <clears throat> Tanya went to WNL back when uh, it wasn't Washington Liberty High School, and um, then the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and is a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel, married to a retired Army Colonel with three girls in college, high school, and eighth grade, I think. Um, but she did all kinds of really interesting jobs from, um, she worked in the Obama White House doing outreach. Uh, President Obama put her on the National Security Council. She moved over to be uh, Assistant Secretary at Homeland Security for Jay Johnson. Um, probably your most famous thing, though, is she was the Guantanamo spokesperson for Barack Obama when he was trying to close Guantanamo. And then the Congress wouldn't let her do it. It was one of those impossible jobs. But, uh, anyway, I, I am incredibly blessed. And then the young man with her is John Daniels. Um, John, we hired a number of years ago at a... <clears throat> When he finished his graduate work at George Mason, he's a Charlottesville kid, um, apparently very famous for his piano playing and his singing, because uh, his mother's a, a, a pastor. Um, but John handles um, half of our, of our caseload in the district office, which is mostly immigration. So if you have a flight tomorrow morning to Great Britain, wherever, um, and your passport's renewed, just call him up, because um, he's really good at getting all those things done overnight. He also handles... Um, uh, all of our district outreach and Falls Church and places like that. So um, t two wonderful people of a, of a really strong team. Um, I, I've been, this is my sixth year in office, and uh, I really like being in the majority. So let's keep this up. <laughs> it's a very different thing. And one of the weird things, I'm on the Ways and Means Committee, which raises all the revenue. I'm on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Um, but the most important thing is I recently, through accidents of history, um, became the House Chair of the Joint Economic Committee. Joint Eco Economic Committee was founded in 1946, the same time they did the President's Council of Economic Advisors. And so it's bipartisan and bicameral. 
So Democrats and Republicans from each house, and we get together twice a month. Mike Lee, who's a conservative Mormon Republican senator from Utah, uh, chairs the Senate side. Um, and that was almost the proximate reason for coming tonight, because we, I, we under, under, you know, I say my leadership, but it wasn't my writing. Um, our committee just released its report on the state of African Americans, blacks in America, uh, the economic status. And I just thought I'd give you the highlights of that, both the good news and the bad news and where we go from here. So if you'll allow me, by the way, this, the full report, which takes half an hour to read, is on the Joint Economic Committee website. So if you want a lot more detail that I'm about to give you, please go on, including beautiful charts that show how it's changed over time. And uh, it's, I didn't get them all blown up for you, but they're really interesting. So the, the good news, um, black Americans are entering the middle class, more black Americans are entering the middle class than any time in American history. The share of black adults with high school diplomas or GEDs is rising, but it's almost nearly converged with that of white Americans. So there's almost equity there. And the share of young black adults who are high school dropouts has fallen by more than half since 1990. This is particularly important for me because for 15 years, um, in fact, when, when Doug Wilder was governor, I was lieutenant governor, uh, one of the things I did was revive the Jobs for Virginia Graduates program, which is the state's largest high school dropout prevention program. We've had it in Arlington off and on, Alexandria off and on. Um, right now we have 25 high schools, but Governor Northam just tripled the budget. So we'll be able to be 75 or 80 high schools next year. And the goal is to try to, we have an, over a 95% success rate of the kids who don't join the program do not drop out, they actually finish. It's a school to graduation to work program. Because in all the years that I was touring the state as Lieutenant Governor um, and visiting you know, 134 cities and counties, the two things that jumped out at me most quickly about driving poverty were lack of finishing high school and having a baby too young. So the other piece that we've been working on, I've been on the board for years, of the DC campaign to prevent teen pregnancy. Because you can prevent that first baby till they're grown up, till they've finished high school, or if they have the first baby, not to have the second baby within 18 months, the likelihood of them having a secure economic future is much greater. Black college graduation rates doubled more than doubled from 1990 to 2018. And in 2017, the share of black women enrolled in college exceeded the share of white men enrolled. <laughs> this is an interesting thing. Um, but they're, black women are doing really well. Um, and then incarceration rates for black Americans fell by nearly a third from 2007 to 2017. Still a horrible problem, but it's moving in the right direction. <clears throat> and then the gap in life expectancy between non-Hispanic blacks and whites decreased between 2006 and 2010. So once again, life expectancies are converging. And one of the most interesting things is if you are a black man who's 60 years old or, or more, um, you're gonna live longer than a white man at that age. So the, if you can make it past those dreadful diseases of your 40s and 50s, um, you're actually in better shape um, than the white population. Also, these two things, uh, one thing wasn't in the report, but um, if black Americans were their own nation, it would be the 10th richest nation in the world, um, which is a pretty amazing thing. Now, there's a lot of bad news, too, though. Um, the black unemployment rate is still twice as high as the white unemployment rate. This is especially true with young black men. The median net worth for white families is 10 times what it is for black families. Um, as more than one presidential candidate has said, you're not going to overcome 400 years of slavery and Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination and massive resistance with a race-neutral policy. Just saying, oh, everybody's even now. Um, it's going to take, since most white wealth is inherited wealth, you know, what my parents inherited from their parents, what I inherited from my parents, et cetera, it's going to be really tough if you don't have anything to inherit. Fewer than half of black families own their home compared to nearly three-fourths of white families. There's a huge difference in home ownership. And black households earn just 59 cents for every dollar that a white household earned in 2018. We're still, uh, despite the progress made on black incarceration, we as a nation are still the number one nation in the world in the number of people incarcerated, and we're the number one nation in the percentage of our population that's incarcerated. I'm so glad Parissa's here tonight, because uh, part of the Justice Democrat movements is, is changing that equation. 
And uh, again, not in the report, but part of the other work I'm doing, hate crimes are on the rise uh, in every state in the country. Um, and, and without being political, that at least partly legitimized by a president who says there are good people on both sides. You know, there's, there's been this empowerment of white supremacists. Um, it's so many things, including a couple that are still in the White House. Um, <clears throat> So whose resignation or firing I've called for a number of times. Well, let, me, let me talk about good news, though, because there are many more ways forward. Um, and I'm just going to sort of grab six big areas. And forgive me if I leave some out that you will bring, bring up. Um, number one is, is trying to come to grips with the disparities in health between black health and white, white health. And one of the interesting ideas is launching an interagency national health equity strategy. You know, out of the CDC, out of Johns Hopkins, the public health thing, to deal with um, the, probably the most important one is diabetes. Um, we had a major ways and means hearing recently on um, the, why the challenge of black maternal mortality, not the babies dying, but the moms dying. And the number one, number one or two contributors, which are closely linked, are diabetes and poverty. Um, so we need that national strategy to overcome that. By the way, one of the things I'm, I'm proudest of in my family is I have this crazy cousin who's head of the genetics lab at Harvard who is doing all the great work on being able to fix genetic defects in the human being. Not just in the germ cell for the next generation, but you know, if you have sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis or Huntington's or something like that, within the next 10 years, they're going to be able to go in and actually fix it in your system, which is going to be a dramatic, dramatic thing for, for health in so many different ways. Um, a second big thing is, is the whole education system. I have to go back, look, look up HB 332 and see what it does. Um, but I know we, we're in the move in Virginia and many other places of making the first two years of college free, community college. Ironically, it was a Republican mayor of Memphis, and then a Republican governor of Tennessee that did it. But it's happening in California, New York. It's on Governor Northam's agenda. And that will really help with the college debt piece. Um, and then in this current budget, which we're working on right now, there's once again a big step up for HBCUs um, and then strengthening them ac across the country. By the way, college debt, which is another big piece, there's a variety of interesting initiatives on the Hill, some of which will pass. Um, one is to, right now, if a business pays for your college tuition, you get a deduction, but if they pay your debt, um, it, you don't get a deduction. It is treated as extra income. We're trying to fix that this year. Another is giving people with college loans the ability to refinance. My wife and I co-signed on one of my daughter's friends because her parents' credit wasn't appropriate at the time. So, and she went to the University of Pittsburgh, and so now she's been out two years. She owes $90,000. Um, and her interest rate's 9%. I called them up and said, you know, I got a pretty good credit score. My wife's is much better than mine. <laughs> Why is it 9%? And they said, because we take her uh, credit rating. I said, I'm guaranteeing the loan. They said, no, we're, we're still going to charge her 9%. So that that's hopefully will change this year also. Um, the third big piece is, is closing the, the wealth gap. I hope you guys know about the Walker to Lewis initiative. Um, like one of the, the great honors of serving the U.S. Congress is getting to know John Lewis, um, who is one of the sweetest, humblest, kindest men I've ever met in my life. He, all you have to do is be an absolute nobody and ride the elevator with him, and he'll make you feel really important. And it's so, so sad but hopeful that you know, people are really going to, uh, after his cancer, in the most aggressive possible way. But the Walker Lewis Initiative does a bunch of things. A huge entrepreneurship fund. Uh, $10 billion within five years to invest in black entrepreneurs. Because as we know, as my dad used to say, businesses don't go broke for lack of profit. They go broke for lack of capital. If no one will lend you the business to start, you're never going to get off the ground. The second thing is the Walker Lewis Debt for Jobs Plan, which would literally say if you create a job and employ three to five people, it gets rid of all of your college debt or other debts that you have to put together. And then um, something that showed up in a number of the presidential campaign plans is committing fully 25% of federal contracting to underrepresented communities. I was at a Jerry Connolly hearing this morning on uh, security clearances, and the most eloquent person there was a young, not, not young, younger than me, um, a firm called Ronan out in Leesburg that was uh, African-American owned, 
um, and, and he was complaining bitterly about how he couldn't qualify for the contracts, but Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics would get them and then give them to him, but they take 30% of the profit off the top so that he couldn't compete, and then he couldn't pay his people enough, and then the big guys would steal his people because they could pay them more. Um, so there, there's a lot of things, getting those contracts directly there, not just pass through. And then passing the Community Homestead Act, which much like, you know, so many of my grandparents, great-grandparents got the Homestead Act and got land, um, it would actually give land and homes to residents of formerly redlined neighborhoods to, cr to close the gap on home ownership, you know, in a way that literally gives those homes um, away. Number four is addressing racism in the criminal justice system. I'm glad that Parissa is here tonight um, because there's so many things that are happening already. I am a huge opponent of mandatory minimums. Um, I've gotten in trouble a number of times for not voting for bills that attack bad guys, but they had mandatory minimums in them, and I promised that I would never do that. Um, we, one of the small changes we just passed in the House was um, allowing federal banks to handle marijuana transactions. You know, because marijuana was illegal at the national level, everything was in cash, which is just an attraction for organized crime. So you had these big companies in Oregon and Colorado that were all cash. So that's the first step. And there's across the board Democrat, Republican support at the federal level for legalizing marijuana, not just decriminalizing, but legalizing it. Um, one of the my great disappointments in Hillary not winning is that she had promised to abolish all private prisons at the federal level, which I strongly support, and we should do it at the state level too. Eliminating the for-profit bail industry. You know, it's just crazy when you create a profit motive to keep people in jail. Um, and then the right to vote for all formerly incarcerated people. And I think that that will be... To, Terry McAuliffe, even if it was with uh, one of those automatic pens, still signed almost 200,000 restoration of rights, which is a very important thing. Number five is looking at environmental justice. When Nancy Pelosi created her select commission on climate change, I, of course I went to her and asked her if I could be on it, and she said no. Um, I, I, I want people who understand the environmental justice perspective from their community. So she put Don McKeeson on instead. Um, that we have to realize that if you're looking where do they locate a nuclear power plant or a coal power plant or a waste, waste dump or anything else, it's almost always in those neighborhoods that have the least money and the least political power. So as we try to reverse the awful three years of EPA rollbacks of the Trump administration and get back to an environmental agenda that is very forward looking, not just climate change, but including climate change. We need to especially, especially look at uh, underrepresented communities and at environmental justice. And then finally, all, everything around voting rights, um, which um, HR1 was the very first bill we passed. It was in, in Congress, it was co-sponsored by every single Democrat. I don't think it got a single Republican vote, sadly. But it did everything from automatically registering voters, uh, vote by mail, which I hope will be a Virginia thing soon, Making Election Day a national holiday, um, which I, again, I think uh, p part of um, Ralph Northam's stuff. Uh, public, small donor public fin financing. HR1 has a deal where if you give, I think it's up to $500, it's matched five to one by the federal government. So a $200 giver becomes a $1,200 giver. But a $1,200 girl still stays a $1,200 giver. So you're taking all the, the small donations and turning them into larger donations so there's some sense of equity and all that. It gets rid of gerrymandering, um, which is, you know, it's the oldest thing in the world where elected officials get to choose their voters rather than the voters choosing their elected officials. Um, strengthening the census in every way we can and moving to a national popular vote. Again, as the presidential candidates say, doesn't it make sense that the person who got the most votes should be elected president? So. Um, Anyway, that's just uh, the tip of the iceberg. One other thing, um, Bobby Scott's been leading for a number of years now um, the, the minimum wage movement. And, you know, Donald Trump takes a lot of credit for people in the lowest quintile seeing their wages rise faster than they have in a number of years. What he omits is that's almost always driven by jurisdictions that have voted for a higher minimum wage. It has nothing to do with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It has to do with states saying, we're going to pay people 15 bucks an hour. And we made some progress here at the National Airport, both their people and the contract people. But we need $15. And then Bobby's bill, which I'm a proud co-sponsor on, actually takes it to $20. 
um, and over by 2024, 2025. But it has to be there. By the way, you know, I served in Switzerland for four years. I was Barack Obama's first ambassador to Switzerland in Liechtenstein. And the minimum wage in Switzerland is $48,000 a year. So if you go to McDonald's, you're going to pay $11 for a hamburger. <laughs> All right? um, but there's no poverty um, because everybody there has a decent wage to begin with. Um, so no homelessness. The Marines in Mar at embassies across the world have a Toys for Tots program. They quit it there because they couldn't find any tots that needed their toys. <laughs> and this is what you get when you make, make the commitment as, again, at, at $7.25 an hour, there's not a single county in America where you can rent a one-bedroom apartment We're making $7.25 an hour. So as uh, more than one candidate has said, it's just immoral that you could have a minimum wage where someone's working full-time year-round and can't afford just to basically to live. Um, so I, I love my job. Uh, we have, we've done, I, I compare this past year in the U.S. House to 1965 with Lyndon Johnson. And we had the, the Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act and NEA and NEH and Social Security, or no, Medicare, Medicaid, lots and lots and lots of big things. The bad part is of the 400, almost 500 bills we've sent to Mitch McConnell, almost all of them are sitting on his desk. And the only thing he's doing is, is um, ratifying right-wing judges to serve life terms. Um, so we have a lot of political work still to do. And, Come to Washington, too, not just Richmond. Um, and because we have painted a vision of what America's future can look like if we have people that are acting on our values in charge, not just Democrats, but Republicans, too, that will live up to those. Um, but we have work to do in the White House and work to do in the Senate. And, uh, but I'm really pleased that the NAACP has been there for each and every one of those fights and will continue to be. And with that, I would love to take any questions or listen to any speeches, or uh, give the agenda back to the chairman. So there's a, yeah, data. Yeah, yes, and we did pass it. It is HR four, um, and you know Nancy Pelosi gave the cool numbers, you know, two, three, four, five, six, you know, to uh, like eight was uh, universal background checks. Um, and seven was um, the Paycheck Fairness Act. Because right now, it's been the law of the land for 50 years that men and women make the same for the same job, but there's been no enforcement. So the Voting Rights Act, and also there's no data. So you come to you know, Don Byer Volvo and you have no idea whether the women are making the same. So it requires every company with 50 more people to report their data by gender, not by name, but by gender for each job position. So you can go back in and say, that's not fair. I'm, we're, we're going to sue you or, you know, you get your lawyer to act on it. Uh, by the way, it's also, that's a good thing for managers, too, because um, if you're committed to paying men and women the same and you don't know what the data is, you can't do anything about it. So, um, But anyway, HR 4 was uh, led by Bobby Scott, again. And, and we're really lucky because um, Bobby chairs the Education and Labor Committee in Congress, and he's been there since 1992. Um, I served with Bobby in the Senate for a bunch of years. A wonderful guy. So, um, and that passed the House in November, perhaps? Yeah, which fixed the, that voting rights section that the Supreme Court had thrown out. Once again, it's not the law until it pa passes the Senate. But, but when, if you get bored, I'll tell you how we're going to take the Senate back. So, all right. Um, I, I mean, first of all, I just want to talk about how I am very proud of my delegate Martha Lee for um, uh, introducing House Bill 894 because uh, if, it, if it, you're still fun about that other House Bill, like I think this will probably make up for it in a way because uh, you know people like myself who have grown up in Fairfax County Public Schools, um, they we have always grown up thinking there was no such thing as positivity. And I've been excluded from so many things. Can, can you tell us what HB 894 does? It basically retrains teachers to provide more positive reinforcement, uh, not just to any student, but to autistic ones as well. And uh, it basically uh, prohibits uh, seclusion and limits restraints to only white and pregnant moments. And uh, I, I think this is something we've needed for years. Um, so I just, I want to uh, thank Mark for that. I've worked with Megan Aldertown for so long, so uh, 
I'm just hoping that we can see the same thing at the federal level that we can uh, assure that our schools are safe for autistic kids and that any kids that would be vulnerable to this. So. Let, let, let me provide the national thing because I've been I've been the lead on this bill for five years and Bobby Scott uh, is the it now has his name on it as it should be because he's chair of the committee um, and it, it bans all seclusion of students and by the way uh, as Alex knows it, it, it really hits kids that that are anywhere on the autism spectrum but it overwhelmingly hits children of color and children with disabilities overwhelmingly especially little boys of color they're the ones most likely to be locked in a closet for hours at a time or secluded and there's all bands uh, all um, you know no handcuffs no leg irons um, all kinds of the other restraints you probably saw how Illinois recently discovered they had an enormous problem and Governor Pritzker came in and in 24 hours banned it all across the state by executive order so we will pass that again this spring in the Congress. Once again, it will land on Ms. McConnell's desk. And, and that may actually, this is very bipartisan. Yeah, although I do get, I get a lot of Republican pushback uh, in Congress saying, just let the states decide. You say, yeah, okay, but there are 50 states and 22 have regulations of varying summer shifts to summer, and 28 states have nothing. So we, we need federal legislation to do it, so. The fun fact, the same people that come to Mark's Bashing about this, taking guns. Like the same people have said, Oh, autism now, that's a good advocacy. So I, like, I know this has bipartisan support. So that's why I push so hard for it every day. So thank you so much. Screw up. We get the next president to invite you to the signing ceremony. Cole? Right, so. uh, Congressman, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Nicole. I was wondering uh, what are your priorities this year? If you had like top five bills that you've been pushing, what would those be? Maybe I should let Tanya offer it, but um, <clears throat> the, the, the problem, I, I'm on, I have a whole bunch of different ways and means bills, but probably the one that I'm most excited about, um, Susan Delbani from Seattle and I are doing, uh, increases the low income housing tax credit by 50%. All the people that build low-income housing, the APA people, for example, um, say that you know, they run out by, by June or July. The, the, the analysis on it is it will create 550,000 new affordable homes in the next 10 years. So it would be a dramatic, and right now, we're 7 million homes short in America, um, 150,000 just in this area. Um, a, a second one is uh, on um, suicide prevention. You know, I got deeply into this when we get so frustrated with being able, unable to pass any gun bills, because two-thirds of gun deaths are suicides. Last year, 47,000 Americans took their own lives. Um, and as we know from all kinds of psychological studies, <clears throat> people are usually only in a suicidal state for about 30 minutes. If you can get them past that 30 minutes, they might be okay for the rest of their lives. So we have three biggest sub-initiatives. One is the new 988 number. Um, you know, nobody in this room probably knows what the hotline number is for the suicide. I don't know, and, but um, it should be like 911 or 411. So 988 is the new number, and we want to get that out to everybody. We want to teach people how you talk to somebody that might be suicidal or depressed, because that's changed completely. And then we have a big barriers bill to take away, you know, the think nets on the Golden Gate Bridge. Once they put the nets up, people weren't jumping off, off the bridge anymore. Um, and then one of the, the longer term plays that I have is the, the, the Fair Representation Act, which changes the way we elect members of Congress um, by moving to multi-member districts with ranked choice voting. Um, and it does a number of things, because right now th there's a well-established political principle that single member districts like we have now, with, with plurality voting, you could win with 37%, inevitably leads to highly polarized two-party systems. So with ranked choice voting, every place has been put in place, like San Francisco, um, and the examples all across the country, you get many more women elected and many more people of color elected. Because all of a sudden, that Republican side, um, which right now there are 200 Republican members of the House. There's one African American, and he's retiring. There are 13 women, and three of them are retiring. So they all look like me, <laughs> and they're old white guys. And, but when you put up a ticket of three or five, you're almost inevitably gonna try to make it look more like America. You're gonna put women on it, you're gonna put people of color on it. Um, 
And so you end up with both parties looking a little more diverse, which also means people are going to come together and to find it. So, by the way, it's a lot easier to negotiate with the Democrats because we are so diverse than with the Republicans that are locked into one, one particular section of our culture um, and, and nothing else. So. But we have a, a um, you know, Daniel's not Galeria, maybe because I, we have a long, long list. Um, my, my legislative director is a wonderful young man named Zach Kaferitz who I inherited from Jim Moran, and he's one of the smartest three or four people in Washington. Um, his mom, Peggy Cooper Kafritz, um, founded the Duke Ellington School. And, uh, and so Zach's the deputy chief to Tanya, and um, he drives me really, really hard. <laughs> it's a good thing. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, what would you Wondering, um, what, what is the, the political strategy for Democrats in the House to move things through the Senate? What, what, what's the strategy there? Because the bills that you described sound wonderful, but we can't get them into law. Yeah, the, you know, one of my strategies is to try to start everything with Republicans. For example, um, the, the, all the suicide prevention bills I'm doing with John Katko, who is a Republican. Um, our, our low income tax credit we're doing with a couple of Republicans on the Ways and Means Committee in the hopes that Mitch McConnell will look and say, oh, look, it's bipartisan. Let me take it up. So far, that hasn't really worked because he's just not taking up almost anything. By the way, one of the things, Elizabeth Warren said this the other night in the debate, and I heartily agree, that when Democrats take the Senate back, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the filibuster. We have, it just, you know, it, 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 maybe it worked in the old days when, uh, you know, you had to stand up and stand and speak on the House floor for four straight days with bathroom breaks. Right now, they just send an email and say, I filibuster. So they need to change it because basically you need 60 votes for anything to go to lunch, to adjourn. And so, um, as Nancy Pelosi says, 50 is the new 60. We need to get it. And, you know, the Democrats did it away with judges because they were so frustrated they couldn't get Barack's judges done. And then... McConnell did it away with a Supreme Court judge, and now it needs to be done away with legislation. Because um, even if you had a 53-47 Democratic Senate and a Democratic president, if you're stuck at 60, you may still get nothing done. So I went from being a car dealer with approval ratings of about 12% down to Congress at 8%. You know? um, and, and the only reason I think why well, Congress is so, um, people's opinion is so low is because they feel like all these big things that you need to get done, guns and minimum wage and the environment and roads and every, you know, we, we don't get it done. Um, and I think that 60 vote margin is one of the big reasons we don't. So. Yes, Matt. So just related to that, 600,000 folks in D.C. they're not represented. And now that Steny Boyer has changed his position, I'm, I actually don't know, I think you can just pass at a state, but how can we, do you have any thoughts about how we might be able to get representation? And that might help with your Senate problem, too. Yeah, we, um, again, the 50 votes would probably do it, but it actually takes a constitutional amendment. So the House, again, this year has already passed Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's carried it for years and years and years. Um, but this is the first time in a number of years that we that we had a majority, we could do it. Ever since 2010, when the Republicans took it over, nothing happened. So we did pass that again, I think it was December, November, December. Again, we send it to the Senate, nothing will happen. But we know exactly, if we take back the Senate, we know exactly what we're gonna do on a couple of hundred pieces of legislation. And then hope that Mark and Tim and the others will get that through, through the Senate. Um, but but the, I think to add DC, we're gonna have to, it probably ends up going to most of the other states also to, to ratify. Yes, please. I'm um, really concerned about education. It's kind of what I do. And um, I think that the Department of Education right now is a little stagnant, shall we say. <laughs> and very I'm cool. wondering what can be done, say, in a dream world where we had a Democratic House, Senate, and White House. What, what changes would you recommend with respect to how education policy comes out of Washington? I don't, I don't have a good answer um, to that. Uh, the, you know, I, the big picture is you need to get rid of Betsy DeVos. You need to get, you need to get secretaries of education that believe in public education. You know, because her, her whole thing has been, 
supporting the private schools, you know, vouchers for Christian schools or Buddha schools, whatever, and, and supporting the, the for-profit colleges, because that's what her family owns. And yet we've seen that some of the worst abuses have been coming out of the public private colleges. In fact, one of the things that happened in the Obama administration was they set up a whole process for canceling the debt or reimbursing the people, mostly canceling the huge debts, that of people that went through these private for-profit colleges and, and were, were lied to. Uh, and so I forget what the percentage is, something like 2% of the ones that have been submitted to Betsy DeVos have been processed and all the rest have been either rejected or just buried. But that doesn't really answer your key question, which is what do we do about K through 12? which is where we have the, the greatest needs. Um, and it's complicated because education has always been a local responsibility, local concern. Most of our states 200 years ago when our values, our, our income, our wealth was all in land, structured it all on property taxes, um, which has been a disaster because it, as our, our two county board members nod their head back there, it, it makes it so difficult to have any kind of equity because the places where, um, land values are lowest is where you're going to have the least investment in schools and it just is going to perpetuate um, poverty. The thing that I would most like to see is a massive public, uh, in, including at the federal level, investment in teachers. That where, where you have, in fact, the, the only time I ever quote Lee Iacocca is he said, if we pay teachers what we pay lawyers and lawyers what we pay teachers, what a different world we would have. And there's a wonderful book called The Smartest Kids in the World written by a Wall Street Journal reporter who looked at the PISA test that all the countries take with their kids and, and went to spent a couple of years visiting the top three countries in the world in the PISA test score. Finland, and then South Korea, and then Poland. And Finland was fascinating because a, a, no homework, B, no sports in schools, they go to school. But three, um, teachers is like, one of the most respected professions. It's, it's hard to get into one of their universities to do teaching as it is to get into a medical school in the United States. Um, so they're only getting the best and brightest that go do there. A, a couple of years ago, one of the campaigns, we were over at the Silver Diner um, on Wilson Boulevard with uh, like 11 campaign kids, all 24, 25, 26. And I went around the room and said, what are you gonna do, what are you gonna do? It's like law school, Kennedy School, this is, you know, McKinsey, not one said teacher. And, and that's got to be a different world for us. So. Every time I see a high school teacher, I hug them, you know, because it's so important. Yeah. Thank you for being such a well-behaved audience. <laughs> Stand up. Well, we thank Congressman Don Barr for taking time out of his very busy schedule uh, to come spend some time with Arlington Branch and WCP. And we hope to see you at this year's Freedom Fund Banquet, sir. I know you had some things going on last year, but uh, as always, you have an open invitation to uh, participate with us, and we thank you again for your attending. Um, we are going to finish up a bit early here this evening. Um, so for right now, we're going to open up the floor. Are there any concerns, any issues that members of the branch or the community want to address or bring to the forefront for the NAACP to address? Yes, ma'am. Um, there's going to be a school board, a, a caucus for school board. There are two positions open, and I'd like to get the word out to this community how important it is to participate in those caucuses. Thank you. We will, uh, we will share that information about the caucuses and voting. Uh, our political action chair is here, and you know the GOTV campaign, and there's going to be a couple of elections this year, not only the primary, the caucus, presidential, there's quite a few things going on, so we're going to stay engaged on that front. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.